marks of a good Christian fellowship is something Paul spends a lot of time in Romans chapter 14 and chapter 15 emphasizing. He really is keen that the Christians understand that they, you can't call yourself a Christian and instead you are eating each other up in disagreements and uh, bringing each other down and fighting each other. It is not really a godly mark. So he emphasizes the importance of people cohesively living together, but not as an aid in itself. They are doing all that, number one, so that they bring glory to God, number two, so that they attract the outsiders to the kingdom of God. And um, for that to happen, he argues, we must stop being self-centered and become other-centered and Christocentric. Egocentricity is out of question. Thinking only of yourself will cause you not to want to deal, to work well with others. You also start having class society where you feel like I cannot fellowship with you and so he's not of my level. You know, it's embarrassing to go with poor people. But in a Christian fellowship, Paul is encouraging us to love each other deeply, equally. In respect of what somebody wears, in respect of what level of education he has, in respect of how rich he is or poor he is, once we are saved by the blood of Jesus, we become equal and so can fellowship with, with each other without discrimination. Just look at what he is saying in, in um, uh, Romans chapter 15. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Something similar to what he said in Romans 14. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good, to build them up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it's written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. Verse 4, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide we to have hope. So he is very clear we need to find a way of working together with people. So, what does, how will that work? The word here that will help a fellowship to work together and to remain united is the word bear. We ought to bear with each other. To bear with each other means you are not too happy. You wish somebody was different. But that's because that's the way he is. You accept him the way he is. You are bearing with him. You do not, the word is not to tolerate him, it's to love him the way he is. So he is telling this uh, church at Rome, we as Christians, we must learn how to bear with one another. For example, in verse 1, those who regard themselves as strong ought to bear with the feelings of the weak. So is that what you do? Or do you feel like segregating yourself to only be with Christians who are like you? Or do you accept people who are not like you, who are not as strong as you, who are not as rich as you? He goes on to say in that verse, not to please ourselves. For that to happen, for you to bear with, uh, with people who are not like you, who don't dress like you, who don't speak English like you, don't do things your way. You must, of necessity, not be seeking to please yourself. And that's something you need to ask yourself. Is that true? Do you really bear with the weak? In other words, do you support them? Do you understand the message in Acts chapter 20, verse 35, where Paul reminds us what Jesus said, that it's more blessed to give than to receive. And that means you enjoy 
fellowship with the people who cannot buy you anything, cannot give you anything, cannot encourage you, they don't have encouragement, they don't know, they cannot really build your faith. Because it's more blessed to give than to receive. You will enjoy being with the people that you are contributing to. That's part of what is mentoring. Because when you mentor someone, you may mentor somebody who is draining you. There's nothing good you are getting out of it. But because you are seeking not to please yourself, but to bring glory to God, every time you spend time with a, a mentee, you leave that place drained, yes, but rejoicing and satisfied. And that's one of the things you have to ask yourself if you truly want fellowship. Do as that stand is more blessed to give than to receive. So, don't seek to please yourself. Seek to glorify God by ministering to his people. Therefore, you start living for others. So, ask yourself, does your behavior build the faith of those you are with or not? If it doesn't build other people's faith, then you are not a good example of a Christian in the fellowship. Look at what he is saying in verse 2. Each of us should please our neighbor. Huh? Not yourself. Your neighbor. For their good. To build them up. In other words, you do not relate with the people on the basis, what can I get out of them? How will this benefit me? It's on the basis of, eh? If I relate with him, would I be able to help him to be in a better place? Would I help him to disciple him? Would I help to make him know the Lord more? Would I help him to grow financially? Would I help him to be a better person? Would I help him to have better health? And what motivates you, according to verse 2 of Romans 15, is for that person's good, your neighbor's good, the verse is saying, so that you build them up. Can that be said of you? That you relate with the people and your interest is not what can I get out of them, but how can I benefit them? How can I build them up? Or do you, you the tab who, who takes me for tea and if you buy tea, you will go very unhappy. Because you don't want to spend your money on somebody else. You want others to spend money on you. Hey, yeah, hear you're saying that's not a good character in fellowship. If you are, for you to be the kind of a person God wants in a fellowship, which is the mark of a good fellowship, is everybody is out to doing each other in wanting to help, to build the other person not to exploit others or manipulate them for their, for their good. Look at verse 3. Verse 3 is saying, For even Christ did not please himself, but it is written, The insult of those who insult you have fallen on me. In other words, why are you going to fellowship with the people who are not as good as you, who are who do not bless you, they even are on the periphery of backsliding, but you still want to fellowship with them. Why do you do that? Because you are taking Christ's example. He did not love himself, he loved us and suffered for our sake. And that will be very, very important. Take Christ's example, because your life should be similar to that, that of Jesus Christ. And you need to ask yourself, is that what you are, is that true of you? For everyone that was written in, for everything that was written in the past was written to each of us. So that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. So, the first reason why you have fellowship with people where you are not benefiting at all is because you have the example of Christ. Number two, because that's what the scriptures encourage you to do. 
if you study the scriptures, that's what it will give you. So you will give and help people to understand what the Bible encourages in the Old and the New Testament. That for everything that was written in the past, remember it was written to help you. And when you read it, you will see the many people who were endured. You will see David tolerating uh, Saul who was trying to kill him. And yet he did not even want to kill Saul even when he had the opportunity. And you understand that message of the life of David is meant to show you how you can relate with the people who are trying to be difficult. So you learn something out of the scriptures. You learn then you have the knowledge of God who is the object of our faith. It ensures that you learn how to trust in God who is reliable. And you know something? A small faith in a bridge that is strong is adequate. Even if you are doubting the engineer, doubting anybody, just go through the bridge, trembling. But you make it to the other side because the bridge itself is worth trusting. A lot of faith on a weak bridge is not very useful. The critical thing is, what do you have faith in? What's the object of your faith? And the object of our faith is God. And that object is the one that will cause you to be willing to help others. And to be willing to fellowship with the people who are not very useful to you. It will tie in you patience. That means you can fellowship with the people who are very nauseating, you know, difficult to work with. People who don't keep their word because you are trying to help them. But in the meanwhile, they have not changed. They will still be hurting you. But you have patience with them. And you will be able to wait. It will also mean you can fellowship with people who are in suffering. Because your main job there will be to comfort them in their suffering. And all this, it will start hope in you. Whatever the circumstance, whoever you are dealing with, whatever, however ugly the issue, there's always hope that Christ will pull you through. I think that's what he is saying. Look at verse 5. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had. Talk about the marks of a good fellowship. And I think it will be important to understand that um, everyone works in harmony when they are seeking to honor God. Why? The reason why you can be with people and comfort them is because you yourself are comforted by God. He will, you will get your comfort from Him. If comforted by God, He will give you patience with others. And you will be able to bear with the weak among the people you are dealing with. <coughs> you know, if you want to bring glory to God, it requires working with others in harmony. You know, difference with between us and blowing them up will not bring glory to God. And what you are after, the object of your walk, is glory to God. You know, Christ is the example of working in harmony. And you not work in harmony unless you are willing to be like him, where you think about the welfare of others, not about the 
your own welfare. And that will be something that you need to understand quite well. So, what are we learning in verse 5 and 6? May the God who gives endurance, certainly the endurance with some people, because they will be difficult, they will do wrong things, you have to have endurance. But sometimes, during the endurance, you will be discouraged, you will have a lot of trouble, but God is saying he will give you encouragement. And give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had. He that came from heaven, and according to Philippians chapter 2, he did not count equality with the God. Something to be grasped, something to be fought over, something to... No, he just abandoned it. To come to become a human being. And he's teaching us similarly as in our fellowships. We must be willing to help the smallest of our group. That will be pretty, pretty, pretty important. Then verse 6 is saying, So that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, you go through the endurance, you get the encouragement, which, of course, is critical that it can only happen if you have the attitude Christ had. And if, you, if that be true, it will be important to understand that the, you, you can only go through it by the fact that you are accepting Christ. So that with one mind and one voice. Can you see how important this fellowship is? If you, if you are looking, if you are being what Paul is describing, then the whole fellowship will have one mind and one voice. And when you have one mind and one voice, it will bring glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not that we are not, there are no challenges, there are, not, there are no differences, it's not that there are no people who are rude, but you learn to accept them you learn to continue to help them. And so in the end, you, you will be surprised how glory will come to God because of uh, your endurance, because there are some things to be not enjoyed, but endured. So, may the Lord help us to have this uh, harmony that will bring glory to God and bring honor to the master. Can you think of a situation where fellowship is insensitive? Because some people in the fellowship are insensitive. How do you handle it? You know, many churches keep splitting because you want a uniform group. Have you ever heard of the saying, if you are looking for a perfect fellowship, for a perfect church, Continue looking, but when you find it, don't join it. Why? You yourself know you are not perfect. So if you join them, from the moment you join them, cannot be called a perfect judge. The reason why we are in fellowship is not because the fellowships are perfect, but because clearly God is asking us to accept one another, fellowship with one another. And that will be something very, very important, very important to have at the back of your mind, even as you think about the challenges that one has to go through. So let me ask you, what is the most difficult aspect of your church fellowship? What discourages you? Why do you what makes you feel like even leaving the church? Is it something that Christ died for on the cross? Might it be that you do not have the patience because in whatever you deal with are not worth having patience with according to you. So you don't do it because of them. You do it because of Christ. Is really what the call 
is all about. That's what um, that's what we are learning. Look at verse seven. Accept one another, then, just as Christ accepted you. <laughs> this is what you're being told. You know how you Christ accepted you. Romans five eight. Christ Jesus died for us while we were yet sinners. So when you say accept one another, just as Christ accepted you, it means accept people who are shoddy, accept people who are not there. By working on them, they'll become better over time. But by the time you're accepting them, it isn't very easy. Again, verse 7 tells you, why do you do this? Not because they, you, they owe you anything, but because you want to bring glory to God. Accept one another then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. What you're after is out of the whole thing, Christ will be honored, which is, uh, which is very, very important. Accept one another. In which way areas and what kind of people is the Lord showing you that you don't have a full acceptance of? What is it that is causing division among you so that you have not obeyed Romans 15 verse 7, accept one another? Verse 8 says, For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth. Wow! Christ has become a servant. I think that's something that uh, we need to talk about. Christ has become a servant. Have you become a servant? A servant of people in your fellowship? A servant of the Jews? A servant of the Gentiles? We are talking about God's truth. You are a servant according to God's truth. And that will be something that you need to raise very, very well. That for I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed. Why are you going to have a good fellowship? Because it is in keeping of God's promises, is in accepting one another, is in living with the, in harmony that will, will end up sharing the promises of the patriarchs. And verse 9 says, And moreover, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it's written, Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing the praises of your name. So, we are learning the reason why we should keep in harmony, accepting, accepting one another, is because in the process, we attract outsiders. The Gentiles will come to know God and glorify him, as they written. Therefore, I'll praise you among the Gentiles. I'll sing the praises of your name. It's the way you live that will attract people to the kingdom. Remember the passage? They shall know we are Christians by our love for one another. And that's why Paul is emphasizing this idea of remaining in a cohesive situation. Not because the, the, the people are, des are deserving but because you know very well that will bring glory and honor to God. And that's something you can, you can look at. So, the word of God is telling you clearly in your fellowship there should be no discrimination allowed. Any sense of discrimination is a sign that Christ is not in control of that fellowship. You are not living in a way that 
honors God. And the motivation is so that the Gentiles can get to know the Lord, so that you can attract unbelievers. So they come to glorify God. But uh, you also you're doing it because Christ accepted the bad you. He saved you as a bad person. So why would you find it difficult to, to, to accept others who are also bad? Christ accepted both Jews and Gentiles, is what he is saying. So every type of a person must be fully accepted according to, the, to God's kingdom. May the Lord help us to understand this. Verse 10 is saying, again it says, Rejoice, you Gentiles, with these people. The moment you are a cohesive fellowship, you attract the Gentiles. And the Gentiles will rejoice with you. Verse 11, And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let all the people extol him. Why we, what's the motivation for bringing glory to God? Is so that he can attract the Gentiles into the kingdom, so that they can know him and want to glorify him. That is, so the issue is the Gentiles, the non Christian, the unbelievers. Your cohesiveness, accepting one another. In fact, Paul somewhere else says, instead of taking people to court with, to, before non Christians, it's better for you to be cheated. It's better for you to be, to be negatively affected than to go to embarrass a fellow believer in a, in, a, in, a, in a court of law. So I think it will be important to understand this emphasis on the Gentiles, getting to know the Lord, getting to accept the Lord. Look at verse 13. Verse 12, verse 12 and 13. Again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations. In him the Gentile will hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So really, what we are learning, which is, which is important, is that if you truly are a Christian, you will, st you will still live in harmony with others. Then the world will know. You will be filled with the, with the God of hope. And this God of hope will give you joy. Out of all this and the challenges of this fellowship, you will still have joy, gladness. Maybe we are referring to a deep-seated pleasure and uh, a way of acceptance of, the, of good things. But in addition to that, he is promising us peace, not just joy. You know, one believes the God of hope and the moment you know that God is in control, it is of where you are and circumstances or you are being sorted, you will be at peace. And that will now leave you in hope. Remain hopeful as he helped by the Holy Spirit. And so you remain thanking God and honoring him. So what are we learning? In fellowships, Instead of creating chaos, you would rather be cheated to. You better be the loser. Number two, in a Christian fellowship, you don't just befriend some people. There is no discrimination in a Christian fellowship. Everybody welcomes everybody. You are able to be, to be, to be in fellowship. Thirdly, in a Christian fellowship, our motivation is not glory to ourselves. Our motivation is to bring glory to God. 
And that means you can mix with anybody and everybody, knowing that what you're after is to bring glory to God.